In this class, let us try to understand about drugs affecting respiratory system. So many of the drugs what we were discussing uh, under drugs affecting uh, respiratory system have been uh, covered under different headings and the various classification in pharmacology. So we, in this uh, class we are going to discuss about uh, decongestants, bronchodilators, antitussive agents, mucolytics and expectorants. So we will be gathering the information from various chapters uh, regarding the drugs which, which have been classified earlier. So let us start with the decongestants. So about the nasal congestion, uh, everyone you have experienced it also during cold time. So this will happen because of excess nasal secretion or uh, because of the inflammation and swelling which can be absorbed in the nasal mucosa. Coming towards the primary cause uh, is uh, allergy when the person got exposed to various uh, allergens excesses nasal secretion and inflammation may happen and also it may hap happen because of the upper respiratory tract infection uh, usually in the cold climate uh, these chances are very much high it will uh, cause us uh, congestion of the nasal tract and it dip become difficult for breathing in such condition we will be using uh, decongestants so that it relieves the condition and uh, breathing will become easier so under decongestants we have uh, two main types of drugs, the first is the adrenogenic agents and the sympathomimetics uh, we have studied about this like largest uh, group of uh, drugs are available as in decongestants under adrenogenics and uh, second chance uh, we have with the corticosteroids, even corticosteroids uh, can also act as a decongestants. Let us see this. Even uh, this decongestants uh, can be given in uh, two dosage form, orally it can be given, it is also having some advantage and also disadvantages. And the second route is the inhalation route or in the topically applied form uh, it can be used, it can be applied to the nasal mucosa where uh, instant uh, response you can get with the decongestants. Let us start with the oral decongestants. Uh, if you take an oral decongestant, some advantages like a prolonged decongestant effect can be absorbed. But coming with the onset, it is delayed response, it takes time. But coming with the other uh, topical like quick onset can be absorbed. Then potency wise effective is less potent than the topical. If you are applying topically, uh, more effect can be seen. But as an advantage, no rebound congestion can be absorbed because topically if you are using decongestant uh, agent like uh, there may be a chance of congestion once again after relieving but uh, if the oral it won't be absorbed. Uh, here uh, exclusively we have adrenogenic agents which can be used as oral decongestants. Example phenylephrine and pseudoephedrine. Then coming towards the topical laser decongestants, uh, we have both uh, adrenogenic and steroids. Its onset of action is quick because we are observed with the oral, it takes time. Uh, but it is potent, oral is not potent. Uh, it can sustain the use uh, over several uh, days, can cause uh, rebound congestion also. Continuously it cannot be used because rebound phenomenon may happen. The drug itself can cause congestion, may uh, such that the condition will become more worse. We have uh, topical laser decongestants like adrenogenics, ephedrine you have, oxymetazoline, nafazoline, phenylephrine are the example for topical nasal decongestants. This under sympathomimetics uh, materials you have details related to this. Even we have intranasal uh, steroids like beclomethazone, dipropionate and phenisonide. So they are uh, intranasal steroidal agents. Let us see the mechanism how this nasal decongestant can show the action. The site of action is uh, blood vessel surrounding the nasal sinus. Now uh, if adrenogenics if you are given means uh, they are going to constrict the small vessel that can supply uh, blood to the upper respiratory structures. Uh, as a result uh, this tissue will start shrinking because of the vasoconstrictive response and nasal secretion in the swollen mucus are better able to dry up. Because of the shrinking and constriction response, all the mucus will move out. So thereby nasal stiffness will be relieved. So the constriction is the mode of action of nasal congestions. So then uh, 
other than uh, we have nasal steroids because adrenergic mechanism is the construction whereas uh, nasal steroids what is the mode of action let us see here also site of action it is blood vessel surrounding the nasal sinuses all uh, steroids they have anti inflammatory effect because of uh, this so they can also turn out the immune uh, system so inflammatory uh, responses which can be absorbed because of the exaggerated immune response may be suppressed by this thereby anti inflammatory response can be absorbed so it can decrease the inflammatory uh, reactions thereby it can result in the decrease in the congestion so oral nasal stiffness is relieved so here the mechanism is of two like anti inflammatory response it's having and immune suppression can be absorbed so shrink uh, shrink encorated uh, nasal mucosal membrane so thereby uh, relieve in the nasal stiffness can be absorbed so then coming with the uses of uh, nasal decongestant so relief of nasal uh, congestion associated with uh, acute or chronic uh, rhinitis condition common cold sinusitis hay fever and other allergic conditions so these are the choice of drug let us see some of the side effects of this nasal decongestants so here uh, we have adrenergic class of agent and steroids adrenergic uh, drugs can cause nervousness insomnia palpitation even tremors can be absorbed if uh, systemically if the drug is used because of the adrenergic stimulation so they are going to affect the heart blood vessels and central nervous system all it will undergo stimulation then coming with the uh, steroids uh, local mucosal dryness as well as irritation can be absorbed as a side effect so now let us move on to the other uh, aspect of the drugs used in respiratory system drugs used in the treatment of cough now as you are aware about the cough uh, physiologically if you see cough is a protective reflex mechanism whenever dust enter into the body or some foreign substance enter into the respiratory tract immediately uh, our reflex mechanism try to remove it out so respiratory tract uh, removes it uh, by secreting uh, mucus and the foreign substances may come out so it occurs due to the stimulation of the mechanochemoreceptors in the throat respiratory passage or stretch receptor in the lungs activation will happen because of the reflex mechanism so now uh, in the cough we have two types one is a non productive that's a dry cough and a productive cough tenacious cough also it's called as so let us see about the non productive cough cough is considered as uh, serving uh, no useful purpose it is because rather than uh, increase discomfort to the patient it won't do anything See, such a non productive cough should be treated because here there won't be any secretion so in dry cough management some of the anti tussue agents are used because they make the patient condition very worsen coming to the productive cough here the difference like uh, mucus secretion can be seen so it is characterized by presence of excess sputum and may associated with the condition such as uh, chronic bronchitis so in this uh, condition uh, we should use some expectorant because they are going to remove out the excess sputum which got secreted then coming towards the ideal properties of this anti tussue agent this anti tussue agent should uh, suppress the frequency as well as the intensity of the cough that should not affect the normal elimination of excess secretion completely it should not block the natural secretions only frequency and intensity should be reduced because uh, during a dry cough condition unprotective cough the frequency and intensity of coughing will be very much high such that it causes irritation such that completely should not block only the frequency and intensity should be get reduced such that normal uh, physiology should not be get affected coming towards the expectorant so it uh, increases the volume and decreases the viscosity of the secretion so once uh, volume get increase and uh, viscosity get uh, decreased so propulsion of the secretion can be seen upward and outward by the ciliary movement and coughing whatever the secretions got uh, released so that will comes out from the respiratory system so this is the effect of expectorant let us uh, classify the drugs used uh, in the management of cough like we have peripheral acting agents and central acting agent because already we are classified cough also by identifying the cough the drug can be selected 
So peripheral acting, we have pharyngeal demulsions, just the irritation in the throat, uh, it can be reduced by using demulsions. So we have a selected class like expectorants, in that we have mucokinetics and mucolytics, as a word it says like kinetics which will helps in the propelling out movement of the cuff substances, whereas uh, mucolytic means they are going to increase the viscosity by breaking the mucus. So then we have central acting uh, agents, uh, opiates and non opiate agents. Let us see some of the examples of the drugs under the classification. We have peripheral acting agent, pharyngeal demulsant. So we here we have pyroxidin and uh, glycerin, liquorice, lozenges, lintus containing syrups, just soothing effect they are going to show, thereby irritation can be reduced. Up. We have expectorants in that we have mucokinetics, examples are ammonium chloride, sodium citrate, potassium ionide, guafenicin, ipacuana, so they helps in the movement, propelling out of the mucus which got secreted excessively. So then we have mucolytic agents, examples are Vasaka, Bromexin, Ambroxyl and Dronacy, Alpha, Acetylcysteine. So any of the cough uh, syrup, if you observe the ingredients, so a combination of these uh, agents you can observe in the cough syrup bottle. Let us uh, see about the centrally acting agents, like we have opioids and non opioidal agents. Opioids examples are codeine, folcodeine, morphine, ethyl morphine. Whereas we have non opioids like noscapine, dextromethorphan, piperazetate, and uh, clofidinol and oxaliden. Even a central and peripheral acting agent we have either said benzone and it are the agents like they act both central as well as peripheral. Let us start with the anti tertiary agent in the dry cough condition it is used. So drugs used to stop or reduce coughing. Here we have opioidal and non opioidal agents. So these are also called as narcotic and non narcotic agents. So it is used only for non productive cough, it is a dry cough. So let us uh, see the mechanism of action like opiates, they are going to suppress the cough reflex by direct action on the cough center in the medulla, example is codeine and hydrocodeine. This we have came across uh, under uh, opioidal uh, agents, opioidal analgesic chapter we came across with the anti mechanism, so similar drugs can be used as anti agent. Now we have central acting agent, the drugs that act on the central nervous system to raise the threshold of cough center to reduce the tussle impulses or the codeine we have seen under opioidal, so they are going to increase the threshold of the tussle responses, once the threshold get raised, so cough automatically it will be get suppressed. So the main aim is to control rather than elimination of the crop. Uh, now cough elimination means we should use some expectorant, so here they are going to reduce only the cough. So these are uh, mainly useful for dry unproductive cough or if cough is disturbing sleep or some hazardous condition it is means in such condition only this agent should be used, otherwise it is not the choice for and, uh, mucus or wet type of cough it should not be used. Now let us move on to the drug that is the codine. It is an opium alkaloid, it is a semi synthetic derivative of uh, opium that is a morphine. Uh, qualitative if you see means uh, they are very much similar but uh, less potent than the morphine. Uh, addiction liability still persists but it is very less when compared to the morphine. Without prescription this codeine cough syrup you won't get in the market. It is more selective for cough center and it is uh, treated as the standard anti tissue agent. So it can suppress the cough center for uh, 6 hours, it is administered orally 10 milligram uh, twice day uh, or thrice a day it can be administered. So abuse liability is low at uh, these doses, but uh, it is one of the addiction causing agent, the people may start consuming more dose thereby it may be abusing agent without prescription it is not available. Coming towards the side effect. What you have came across in the morphine, the same uh, we can enlist over here. High dose can cause respiratory depression, conversion can be seen, postural hypotension and constipation can be observed as a side effect.
the next uh, drug under uh, the class that is a uh, whole codeine so they resemble many uh, activity related to the codeine it is structurally related to the codeine but it is uh, slightly more potent and longer acting and uh, better tolerated than codeine actually uh, codeine is a synthetic derivative of uh, morphine but compared to the potency wise folk codeine is having more potency so it can cause lesser constipation and drowsiness than the codeine because uh, morphine and its derivatives are very commonly they have a complication side effect of constipation but folk codeine is having less chance of ha- causing constipation so it is uh, more suitable for long term use so orally 10 to 15 mg twice it date it can be given so next uh, drugs and uh, antidepressants so that is uh, dextromethorphan it is the methyl ester of the dextro isomer of levorfan so it is uh, less addiction liability it's not having uh, analgesic action so least constipation effect and minimal drowsiness can be observed so these are the properties just we are comparing with the morphine class of agent so it is a less potent as codeine and uh, given orally 10 mg thrice so most uh, popular cough syrup present agent is the dextromethorphan so combinations are available uh, usually it used to be get combined with antihistamines and uh, some of the bronchodilator in the form of a cough mixtures they are used in many syrups you can come across with this dextromethorphan so next uh, agent and antidepressant so that is noscapine so it is a natural occurring opium alkaloids uh, belonging to benzylia iso quinolone group it's a popular cough suppressant given 15 uh, mg thrice daily it can be given uh, less addiction liability can be observed in comparing to the morphine class and codeine drowsiness and uh, and anxiety activity also very least it's not having uh, such activity coming to the side effect at high dose it may produce nausea headache and tremors can be observed as a side effect of noscapine the next drug is piperazetate this piperazetate group of uh, antidepressant agents uh, are occasionally used so given orally uh, 50 uh, sorry 40 mg thrice daily it can be given so next uh, is the colfidenol so it is less effective rarely used dose 20 mg twice daily it can be given so even high doses can cause uh, excitatory effect and tremors they are not popularly used so then uh, we have one more class of agent that is a benzonidate so they are used uh, both uh, central as well as peripheral mechanism for showing both uh, responses can be blocked it is a best anti tetracycline agent structurally they are related to local anesthetic tetracaine so it not only inhibits the afferent cough impulses to suppress the central cough center but also they can inhibit the pulmonary stretch receptor and also possess local anesthetic action so that by both central and peripheral responses they can show administration uh, by oral 100 to 200 mg oral it can be given side effects are drowsiness nausea headache even uh, high dose it can cause vertigo this is a central and peripheral acting antidepressant agent so let us see uh, the mechanism of action of uh, non opioidal uh, antidepressant agent so they suppress the cough reflex by causing a numbness on the stretch receptor in the respiratory system once a numbness happened this uh, stretch receptor won't be get stimulated by any type of triggers so thereby prevent the cough reflex of being stimulated so thereby it can show the antidepressive response so example is benzonidate and dextromethorphan so coming towards the therapeutic uses of antidepressive agent used to stop the cough reflex when the cough is non productive and sometime cough may be harmful in such condition it should be used say for example after the radiation therapy or surgery sometime uh, dry cough will be observed that's a non uh, productive cough because of the dryness it is very uh, dangerous in such post operative condition so in during that time also it can be used so coming towards the side effects of uh, various antidepressant agents benzonidate uh, dizziness headache and sedation can be seen dextromethorphan dizziness drowsiness nausea 
coming towards the opiates, sedation, nausea and vomiting can be observed. So next drugs used in the management of cough is expectorants. The word expectorants itself represents which aids in the expectoration of the mucus. They help to remove the mucus substance. For removing a reduction of viscosity is required. Whatever the secretion, if it is very much thick, excretion will be difficult. First thing they are going to reduce the viscosity and uh, disintegrate uh, them and a thin uh, secretion will be get converted such that the thin uh, secretions will be easily removed out from the respiratory system. So they work by direct stimulation or by reflex stimulation. Uh, overall final result if you observe with direct and uh, reflex stimulation is uh, thinning of the mucus so that uh, easily it will be get uh, removed out. So let us see about the direct stimulating uh, response of the expectorants. The secretory glands are stimulated directly to increase their production of respiratory tract fluid. So now once the uh, respiratory tract fluid secretion get increases it become easier to expel out the mucus which got secreted. Example is terpene hydride, iodine containing products such as uh, iodinated glycerol and potassium iodide, direct and indirect stimulation they can cause. So once uh, slight irritation is the mechanism, so secretion will be rising. So thereby it can remove the mucus which got produced. So we have reflex uh, stimulation like agent cause irritation of the GI tract, uh, losing and thinning of the respiratory tract secretion occur in response to this irritation. Example is guafenicin syrup of ipecac. So reflexively they are going to show the response. So these drugs cause loosening and thinning of the sputum which is produced and uh, other bronchial secretion also. So thereby tendency of cough indirectly it will be get diminished because uh, whenever the sputum is thick uh, respiratory system tries to move, remove it out thereby cuff can be absorbed. So thinning uh, and excretion will help to decrease the cuff also. So let us uh, see about the expectorant. We have a class called as mucokinetics. So this expectorant stimulates the flow of respiratory tract secretion by stimulating the bronchial secretory cells. Stimulation of bronchial secretory cells will increase the volume and uh, also they increase the ciliary movement. So thereby uh, they can facilitate uh, the removal of the secretions which can be seen. So thereby mucokinetic response they can see. So they are going to remove out the secretions. Examples are some volatile oils, certain emetics in uh, sub-emetic doses means uh, it won't cause em emesis or vomiting. It will be in the sub-emetic sub doses so that only expulsion of uh, the sputum will be enhanced but they cannot cause vomiting. Uh, some other drugs like ammonium chloride, sodium citrate, guacol and guafenicin are the example for mucokinetics. Some essential oil can be used as a mucokinetic agent. So they provide only mild expectoration by direct stimulation of the bronchial secretory cells. So nowadays usage is very much declined. We are not using essential oil. We have better agents like sodium and potassium citrate can be used 0 0.3 to 1 gram. So after absorption citrate get converted to bicarbonates in vivo and the mucus will become less vis viscous in the alkaline pH so that expulsion will become very much easier. So next agent we have that is the ammonium chloride. So it is a gastric irritant which uh, reflexively enhances the bronchial secretions. Once the bronchial secretion increases so like uh, it can remove out the sputum. So large doses it can produce metabolic acidosis so that we should uh, take care while taking ammonium chloride for longer time. Next is the potassium iodate 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 gram so it is secreted by the bronchial uh, glands and in this uh, process it can cause uh, irritation of uh, the bronchial glands so thereby they are going to increase the volume and secretion so it also act as a gastric irritant and uh, reflexively so they are going to act thereby they are going to expel the sput. Then coming towards the adverse drug events uh, with the iodide containing substances it is dangerous in the patient who are sensitive to the iodine and it can interfere with the thyroid function also so that we should take uh, care while prescribing the drug. 
prolonged use can also uh, can induce goiter and hypothyroidism it is less popular nowadays because of this hazards we are not using iodine containing uh, substances as a mucolytic agents so then uh, other than we have guaifol and uh, guafenicin commonly uh, we are using in a cough mixture so are obtained from the crescent uh, wood but nowadays are prepared synthetically so these are safe uh, expectorant uh, with uh, proven efficacy this guafenicin is uh, less irritating uh, derivatives of a uh, guaifol after absorption guafenicin is secreted through the bronchial secretion so that uh, they can increase the airway secretion and mucosal seal air activity they can enhance mechanism is all the drugs they will show the same so it is administered orally 100 to 200 mg twice a day it can be administered we have one more category that is a mucolytic agents here the word it says like they are going to break the mucus muco lytics alter the chemical characteristics of the mucus to decrease its viscous and uh, facilitate its removal by the ciliary action commonly used uh, mucolytics uh, which include acetylcysteine carboxyl bromhexine and ambroxol almost many of the cough syrup you can see one or two combination along with some antihistaminic agents so let us see about the bromhexine so it is an uh, alkaloid uh, obtained from the wasaka plant so it uh, depolymerizes mucopolysaccharides of the mucus because uh, this mucus is a proteinous uh, substance uh, mucopolysaccharides uh, it's made up of so it's going to break it that's a depolymerization will happen and they also it's going to increase the rhizosomal enzymes activity such so that it will break the fiber network of the tetanus sputum so that sputum will become very much loose and uh, easily it can be get expelled out oral dose is uh, 8 to 16 mg thrice daily it can be given side effects are gi upset uh, renorrhea and uh, that's nothing but the water uh, released from the nose can be absorbed as a side effect as ambrox are very popularly used it's a metabolite as uh, of uh, bromohexin and uh, has similar uh, mode of action of bromohexin oral dose is uh, 30 mg uh, thrice a daily or twice daily it can be given depending on the condition the next drug is the acetyl cysteine it's a mucolytic agent so that decreases the viscosity of the mucus by splitting the disulfide bonds because as i told they are uh, mucus is made up of protein so here uh, acetyl cysteine they are going to target the disulfide bonds so once the disulfide bond got broken said so that the mucoproteins will become very much weaker and very thinning can be seen and uh, followed by uh, its expulsion so this uh, action may be facilitated by alkaline ph 7 to 9 administration is done by the nebulization that's 3 to 5 ml of 20% solution is used and also it can be used in a oral form also 200 mg thrice daily but uh, efficiency is much less when comparing with the nebulization Uh, coming towards the side effect nausea vomiting stomatitis and bronco spam can be observed with acetyl cysteine then one more newer agent we have that is the dones alpha so it is highly purified solution of recombinant human uh, deoxyribonuclease this is an enzyme so this enzyme uh, selectively breaks the dna so now this uh, propellant that's a pus uh, or any pulmonary secretion in the cystic fibrosis uh, may contain very high amount of extracellular dna substances in such condition uh, drone is alpha uh, inhalation that's a 2.5 mg once daily can uh, cause hydrolysis uh, thereby this accumulate the dna in the sputum it will be get hydrolyzed and it will be get broken so it can be helpful in the cystic fibrosis patient so coming towards the <coughs> therapeutic uses of expectorants use it for a relief of non productive type of cough associated with common cold bronchitis laryngitis pharyngitis protosis uh, influenza malaises uh, also cough caused by chronic uh, paranasal sinusitis condition so this expectorants can be used Now let us see about bronchodilators 
and there are sympathomimetic agents also we have seen about uh, bronchodilators in detail. So under bronchodilators there are many class of agents uh, which can cause bronchodilation especially they are helpful in uh, breathless condition and also in uh, management of asthma. So xanthan derivatives are uh, having a uh, bronchodilator response. Examples which include uh, plant alkaloids like caffeine, theobromine and theophylline. So they have bronchodilator response. So now only theophylline is used as a bronchodilator. Examples which include aminophylline, diphylline, oxytrophylline as well as theophylline. They can cause a bronchodilator response. Now bronchodilators we have xanthan derivatives as well as beta agonist can also be used. Other uh, class of agents they can uh, possess some uh, bronchodilator response which include anticholinergic agent, anti-leukotarin agents and corticosteroids and mast cell stabilizers. So even uh, indirectly they can cause a bronchodilatory response. Altogether these drugs can be used in the management of asthma condition. Here only we will be talking about a bronchodilatory response. So let us see the mode of action of this xanthan derivatives. So they can increase the level of uh, cyclic AMP. So thereby level of energy production rises. So this is done competitively by inhibiting an enzyme called as uh, phosphodiesterase enzyme. So this uh, enzyme is having a property to break down the cyclic AMP but uh, upon blockage of this enzyme the level of cyclic AMP may be increased. So this can result uh, in decreased cyclic AMP levels, smooth muscle relaxation can be seen and bronchodilation and increased air flow can be observed. Coming to the properties of this uh, xanthan derivatives, it causes bronchodilation by relaxing the smooth muscles of the airway which uh, causes a relief of bronchospam and uh, it can cause greater air flow into and out of the lungs. Other actions which include uh, CNA stimulation also having action on the cardiovascular system causing cardiovascular stimulation increases force of contraction and also increases heart rate. It can result in increased cardiac output and uh, also increase the blood flow to the kidney. It's also having my diuretic response by excreting sodium and potassium ion. Coming towards the therapeutical uses of this xanthan derivatives, uh, it can uh, possess dilation of the airways in the asthmas and chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Mild to moderate cases of asthma can be managed by using this and uh, as an adjoint agent in the management of COPD, it can be used. Adjoint therapy for the relief of pulmonary edema and uh, paroxysmal nocturnal edema in left sided heart failure, such condition it can be used. Even uh, coming towards the side effects, uh, nausea, vomiting, anorexia is the common side effect. Gastroesophageal reflex during sleep can be observed. Sinus tachycardia, extra or palpitation, ventricular dysarrhythmias can be observed as a side effect. Even a transient uh, increase in urination can be observed because uh, it's having my diuretic response also. So next uh, agent we have indirectly they can possess uh, this response of bronchodilation. They are inhibitors of mast cell degranulation because uh, mast cell can release many of the secondary mediators of uh, inflammation. So thereby uh, even they have potent bronchoconstrictory responses also by blocking uh, the mast cell degranulation nothing but the breakdown of the mast cell. So we can control uh, immunity induced uh, constriction. Examples include uh, chromoylin and uh, ketotiffin, nidochromoyl. So they can antagonize antigen induced Ig mediated mast cell degranulation. So they prevent the release of uh, messengers which include histamine and also slow reacting uh, substances of anaphylaxis. So these mediators can uh, cause bronchoconstriction which can mediate the type 1 uh, allergic reaction. So thereby it can be beneficial in the management of asthma condition. So let us see about the some other agents which can be used like uh, beta agonist we have 
large group uh, of uh, substances uh, will comes under sympathomimetic agents used uh, during acute phase of asthmatic uh, uh, attack we can quickly reduce airway constriction and uh, restore normal air flow it can stimulate beta to adrenergic uh, receptors throughout the lung so thereby bronchodilation can be observed so under the beta agonist there are three types based on the receptor occupant like we have non selective adrenergic so where non selective means it's talking about alpha and beta adrenergic receptor which can stimulate alpha 1 beta 1 and beta 2 receptors beta 2 are respiratory receptor beta 1 are cardiac and uh, even they can stimulate the alpha 1 receptor example is epinephrine non selective beta adrenergic receptor here the difference only it's talking about the beta receptor earlier non selective adrenergic it's talking about both alpha and beta so it can stimulate both beta 1 and beta 2 receptor example is isoprotenol and we have selective beta 2 Uh, drugs uh, they can stimulate only the beta 2 uh, receptor because they are uh, target specific that's a respiratory system albuterol is a agent which can uh, selectively act on the beta receptor thereby they can stimulate the beta 2 type of receptors so let us uh, see about the mechanism of action like it uh, begins at the specific uh, receptor by stimulation and ends with the dilation of the airways because they are agonist thereby they can cause stimulation activation of beta 2 receptor can activate the cyclic amp which can relaxes the smooth muscles of the airway and uh, results in bronchial dilation and increased air flow the detailed mechanism uh, we can observe in the sympathomimetic agents let us see what are the therapeutic uses of this beta agonist so they can uh, cause relief of bronchospasm bronchial uh, asthma condition and uh, bronchitis and other pulmonary diseases and useful in the treatment of acute at attacks as well as the uh, prevention of uh, asthma used in uh, hypotension and shock because they have vasoconstrictory response they can increase the blood pressure because they are adrenergic in nature used to produce uterine relaxation to prevent premature labor this is also adrenergic property and also hyperkalemia it can stimulate potassium shift into the cell so that by in hyperkalemia also it can be used now coming towards the side effects of various uh, beta agonists we have alpha as well as beta and uh, beta 1 and beta 2 non selective and we have a selective class beta 2 here uh, non selective adrenergic like epinephrine it's have insomnia restlessness anorexia cardiac stimulation and vascular headache can be observed whereas non selective beta 1 beta 2 agonist isoprotenol like cardiac stimulation hypotension and tremor when anginal uh, pain and vascular headache can be observed whereas uh, beta 2 selective bronchodilator albuterol uh, is having uh, vascular headache and tremor can be observed so now one more class of agent uh, we have which can cause uh, bronchodilation indirectly because acetylcholine uh, causes bronco constriction and narrowing of the airway whereas anticholinergic can block the acetylcholine response thereby it can cause bronco dilatation so by preventing acetylcholine from binding to the receptors so thereby they can uh, act over the bronco constriction and they can dilate the airways so example of anticholinergic is ipatropium bromide uh, it's only anticholinergic used for the respiratory disease slow and prolonged action it can show and uh, used to prevent bronco constriction so they are not used for acute asthma exacerbations then coming towards the side effects of anticholinergic uh, common like uh, dry mouth and uh, throat uh, distress can be observed headache anxiety and coming with the uh, gastrointestinal uh, complications nausea vomiting can be seen and gastrointestinal distress is observed of and coughing can be seen and coming towards the drug interaction uh, it's not well established we have one more class of agent that is anti leukotrienes are also called as uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists so new class of asthma medications so three sub categories of agents we can come across but currently available uh, montelukast zafrilast as well as 
zeroton are used let us see the mode of action as we know uh, leukotriene uh, can uh, act as a mediator in asthma condition leukotriene substances uh, will be get released when uh, trigger such as uh, some of the foreign substances allergens get exposed such as cat hair or some dust it is it is a mediator so thereby some chemical reactions can be observed in the body leukotriene can cause uh, inflammation bronchoconstriction and as well as mucus production which can uh, result in coughing wheezing and shortness of breath now anti leukotriene agent can prevent this leukotriene from attacking to the receptor of uh, the cells located in the lungs in the circulation so inflammation in the lungs is blocked and asthma symptoms can be relieved by blocking the leukotriene receptors so now coming with the uh, drug effects here by blocking leukotriene so we can prevent a smooth muscle contraction of the bronchial airway dilation can be seen and decrease in the mucus secretion can be observed even it can prevent ventricular uh, vascular permeability also even decrease uh, neutrophil and leukocyte infiltration of to the lung so overall like they can prevent the inflammation and uh, they can cause relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle coming to the therapeutical uses prophylaxis uh, it can be used and also it can be used in chronic treatment of asthma in adults and uh, children over the age of 12 so it's uh, not meant for the management of acute asthmatic attacks even uh, montelukast uh, is approved for use in children age 2 and older then coming towards the side effect like uh, zeloton is having headache dyspepsia nausea dizziness insomnia and liver uh, dysfunction can be observed zafilocast uh, headache nausea diarrhea liver dysfunction can be seen and comparing this like uh, montelukast uh, having a uh, fever side effect the last agent we have with the corticosteroid which is having anti inflammatory response uh, which can be used in chronic asthma but they do not relieve the symptoms of acute asthmatic attack oral or inhalation form it can be used uh, even the inhaled form uh, reduces the systemic effect so may take several weeks uh, before showing the full effect of this the coming to the mechanism action they can stabilize the membrane of the cell uh, thereby releasing uh, substances chemical mediator which can cause bronco constriction will be avoided so this uh, cells uh, which include leukocytes are white blood cells also increase the uh, responsiveness of the bronchial uh, smooth muscle to the beta adrenergic stimulation synergetically they will show the response so we have uh, inhaled corticosteroid like beclomethazone dipropionate tram quinolone uh, acidonate and uh, dexamethasone sodium phosphate and also flunisolide coming to the therapeutic uses uh, treatment of uh, bronchospastic disorder uh, so that are not controlled by the conventional bronchodilator so corticosteroid inhalation treatment is used and uh, it's not considered first line agent for the management of acute asthmatic attack or status asthmaticus coming toward the side effects of inhalation uh, corticosteroid pharyngeal irritation coughing dry mouth oral fungal infection are very commonly observed so fungal infection nowadays uh, during covid also you are coming across because of uh, the inhibitory response on the immune system systemic effect are rare because of low dose uh, used for the inhalation therapy now the last uh, class we have that is the mast cell stabilizer chromoallin and nidochromoallin uh, so indirect acting agent that prevents the release of various substances which can cause bronco spam they stabilize the cell membrane of inflammatory cells especially mast uh, cells monocytes and macrophages that prevents the release of harmful uh, cellular content so there by no direct bronco dilatory action they possess they are used prophylactically so they can uh, block the degranulation therapeutic uses uh, adjuvant to the management of copd it can be used used uh, solely for prophylaxis not for acute asthma attack even uh, can be used to prevent exercise induced bronchospasm used to prevent bronchospasm associated with exposure to some of the triggering agents such as cold or dry or allergens so let us conclude the session by seeing the side effects of mast cell stabilizer like uh, cough coughing can be seen